On a cool spring day in 1775, 14-year-old Peter Francisco, or the Hercules of the Revolution as he would later become known, stood outside St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. Inside, 120 representatives of the 13 colonies steadfastly debated the future fate of America. Peter was born in 1760 in Porto Judeo in the archipelago of the Azores, which at the time was owned by Portugal. Peter's family was from mainland Portugal and was relatively well off. It is believed that until the age of four or five, the boy lived a good life full of plenty and resided in a large mansion by the ocean. However, Peter's family had developed several political enemies, the reason for leaving Portugal and moving to Azores in the first place, and it is believed that it was for this reason that Peter and his sister were kidnapped in approximately 1764. Historians generally agree that the kidnappers intended to ransom the pair off or sell them as slaves, but Peter's sister soon escaped, and for unknown reasons, his kidnappers left the five-year-old Peter on the docks at City Point, Virginia. Despite not being able to speak a word of English, Peter was soon taken in by Judge Anthony Winston, a well-known intellectual at the time, and an activist for a free America. Judge Winston was the uncle of Patrick Henry, and on this day was also Peter's reason for being present at a meeting of such magnitude. After the conclusion of the meeting and overhearing an impassioned plea from Henry to take up arms against their British oppressors, Peter knew he had to fight for his country. At the age of 16, Peter enlisted in the 10th Virginia Regiment, part of General George Washington's Continental Army. However, despite his young age, Peter was a massive 6 foot 4 and over 200 pounds, making him a true giant of his time. The 10th Virginia Regiment saw its first action on September 11, 1777 as the 3,500 troops of the Continental Army staged a vain effort to beat back a force of 12,500 redcoats sent to capture the colony's capital of Philadelphia. However, despite a valiant effort, the Continental soon withdrew with Peter's unit acting as a rear guard. While protecting the retreating column, Peter's musket malfunctioned. Peter ran out from behind cover and grabbed a musket from one of his dead comrades, but as he ran back to friendly lines, the teen was shot in the leg. However, this did nothing to slow him down, and he and the rest of the 10th fought for another 45 minutes, securing the Continental Retreat. Peter's next significant military action came when he was stationed with 400 other men defending Fort Mifflin on Mud Island in the Delaware River. Day after day, week after week, the fort was bombarded by British ships in the river. After a month of bombardment, the British decided that enough was enough and sent five ships to blast the fort into submission. It was soon apparent to the colonials that the only way to hold onto the fort would be to signal American ships further up the river in hopes that they could drive the British gunboats back downstream. Peter volunteered to carry the signal flags to the top of the fort and signal the ships, but his best friend, George McAvoy, was looking for a promotion and so asked Peter to allow him to send the signal. Peter relented and gave the flag to McAvoy, who sprinted towards the ramparts. McAvoy planted the flag, setting the signal for the ships, and turned to Peter with a huge smile, knowing he had secured his promotion. However, upon taking his first step back down the ramparts, McAvoy was hit directly by a British shell, decapitating him and resulting in what was likely the most tragic moment of the war for the giant from Virginia. During the day, most of the fort's armament was destroyed, and it was deemed to be untenable. That night, most of the men left the fort under the cover of darkness, but Peter and 80 others remained behind to destroy the rest of the fortress so that it wouldn't fall into enemy hands. The men burned the emplacement and tried to escape using three longboats. However, the light from the fires illuminated them for the British, resulting in one of the boats being hit by a cannon. The now 6 foot 8 Peter was able to hold the boat alongside his own for long enough for the men to scramble aboard, saving their lives. After escaping Fort Mifflin, Peter spent the winter at Valley Forge and, like many others there, became ill with dysentery, causing him to spend time in a hospital. After surviving the winter and several more combat wounds, Peter and his company were tasked with destroying the British fortress at Stony Point, New York. The Stony Point fortress was formidable, perched on a 150-foot promontory bordered on three sides by river and swamp and boasting some of the most powerful cannons of the Revolutionary War. Several walls and barricades needed to be breached to break into the fort, so Peter and 39 other volunteers formed groups tasked with smashing the barriers to allow the rest of the army inside. This was widely viewed as a suicide mission, but Peter and his fellow commandos grabbed their axes and began to scale the cliff amidst the cover of night to bash through the fortress walls. Part of the way up the hill, the group was spotted, but amid withering gunfire, Peter and a few of his fellow volunteers reached the top. Peter then bashed his way through two walls, reaching the fortress's interior. As the story goes, three British soldiers immediately attacked Peter, who slayed the first. However, the third soldier swiped his bayonet across Peter's stomach, opening up a nine-inch gash. 
Not one to give up because of a superficial little seemingly mortal injury, however, Peter fought off one soldier after another, eventually reaching the flag and tearing it down before he fainted due to blood loss. Peter was credited with having killed 12 British grenadiers during this battle. As a result of the fort's capture, 543 British soldiers surrendered and the British never regained their presence in the north. In the battle, 17 of the 20 men in Peter's group were either grievously wounded or killed. After this experience, with their enlistment ending, most men would happily retire to a quieter and safer occupation away from the war. Not Peter. As soon as he was able, he rejoined the army and was sent to battle again, but this time many of his fellow soldiers were first-time combatants that fled the battlefield as soon as the first shots were fired. Peter was forced to retreat as the line was overrun, and in the forest behind the battlefield lines, he ran into his commander, Colonel Joseph C. Mayo, who was about to be bayoneted. Peter killed the redcoat and then another as he pulled the man off his charging horse. Francisco proceeded to taunt an arriving group of redcoats before retreating on his newly acquired horse. Soon he found Colonel Mayo once more, this time imprisoned by two British soldiers. Peter killed the pair and handed the horse over to the officer. Soon, Peter noticed a cannon the Americans had left behind after it had gotten stuck in the mud. It is then said that Peter hefted the cannon onto his shoulder and carried it back to friendly lines so it wouldn't fall into enemy hands. After securing the cannon, Peter was again attacked and again slayed the aggressor with his own gun before climbing onto his horse and making another escape past a group of redcoats. After Peter was wounded in a later battle, he was transported to Buckingham, Virginia to recuperate. Peter soon volunteered to spy on nearby men, commanded by Bannister Tarleton. In what would later become known as Francisco's fight, nine of Tarleton's men surrounded a tavern that Peter was in and commanded that he come out. Once outside, they ordered Peter to hand over his silver shoe buckles, a seemingly odd request, but one likely made because he had little else and the men wanted to humiliate the teen. Peter told the Brits to come take them themselves, and when they tried, Peter stole one of the soldiers' swords, killing three of the men, and stealing all of their horses in the process. In 1781, Francisco was ordered to Yorktown where he was able to witness the British surrender. Peter, despite being one of the most battle-hardened veterans of the war and having served in the army for over five years, was barely 21 at the time. After the war, George Washington once complimented Peter, saying, Without him, we would have lost two crucial battles, perhaps the war, and with it our freedom. In fact, during the war, the general was so impressed with the young soldier that upon learning that Peter complained that his sword was too small, Washington had a massive six-foot long sword made for him, which was much larger than any other weapon of the time. Peter died at 71 from appendicitis, having worked the previous years as a sergeant at arms for the Virginia State Senate. Upon learning of his death, the Senate adjourned for the day so that the members could attend his funeral.